school is so important. We live in a time when people don't meet for Sunday school very often, and it seems that every church service is evangelistic, and they want to reach for lost souls, and that is good. That is a God thing. But we have many churches today that are filled with people that they don't know a lot about the Scripture, and that's the unfortunate part. You ask them about heaven, they know that there's a heaven, and they know that it's a place, but that's about it. You ask about hell, they don't know much about hell. You ask about judgment. You ask about what it means to be a Christian. They really can't answer those questions. If people out in the world are going to be saved by the church, the church has to be equipped to answer difficult questions. And we have to do our part in Sunday school and in teaching ministry to do our best to prepare a new generation to accept God's word. Because we like to feel good. And we live in a culture and a time where if it feels good, do it. If you want to, fine. If you don't, fine. They don't like commitment. They don't like the difficult teachings of Scripture. They like to feel good. And when they don't feel good anymore, well, they stop coming or they go somewhere else. And the Bible says that if you partner that evangelism with teaching, then you're going to build disciples. You're going to tell them how they should live. You're going to model that behavior to a community that is so desperate, looking for hope in all the wrong places. And so we've got to understand that when it doesn't feel good, that's where teaching picks up. That's where discipleship picks up. A disciple is a man or a woman that says, even though it doesn't feel good, I'm still a Christian. Even though I don't feel something, I'm still going to be a part of that church or this church. Or I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to seek God because I believe what the Word of God says. And so the Bible teaches that you have the Holy Spirit. But you also have the Word of God. And you have to have that partnership between the two. Because there's going to be difficult times. There's going to be dry times. There's going to be times when you feel like you can't feel God. And the enemy's going to do his best to say, you didn't have anything to begin with. He's going to discourage you. That's his job. And he's good at his job. He's going to say, you didn't have any experience at that church. That preacher doesn't care about you. God doesn't care about you. Jesus may have died for them, but Jesus didn't die for you. And so during those times of difficulty, during those times when it feels like that, that all you feel is just being uh, rejected, you have to know that the Word of God says that you are loved. That the Word of God says there is a God and that He made you in His image. You have to believe the Word of God when it says that He will move heaven and earth to do what's best for His children. The Bible says, You being evil, give good gifts to your children. How much more will our Father in heaven give the Holy Ghost to them that would ask? Our Father in heaven knows what we have need of. He knows that we have need of food, that we have need of clothing. He says, Seek first the kingdom of God. If you will seek my presence, if you will seek my face, then your heavenly Father will give you all of your needs. And so we begin here today as a teacher, hoping to look at the Word of God and to encourage you today that God knows who you are. He knows your life. He knows where you're living. He has not rejected you. He has not abandoned you. I wish I could tell you why every test. I wish I could tell you why every trial. I wish I could tell you, but we don't know. And anybody that says they do, they're just not being genuine with you. The fact is that God is sovereign. That means he does what he will. And so those that trust God, those that love God, if our foundation is there is a God that loves me and that wants what's best for me, and if we buy into that, if we believe that with all of our hearts, that he loves me and that he wants what's best for me, every trial, every temptation, every problem, every situation that we encounter, we will still worship. We will still love him because we know that he is going to work it together for our good. No matter how I feel, I worship him because he is good. If you need scripture for that, if you need Bible for that, read the book of Psalms. It's written countless times. Our God is good. Our God is merciful. His mercy endures forever. These are imperfect people going through trials, going through problems in their own lives, and they're reminding themselves God is good. God is merciful. God is holy. I may not be, but God is. 
I may not be good, but God is. My situations may not be good, but God knows about them. God loves me, and God will react on my response. I believe that. Because the Bible says, you ask in my name, and you shall receive. And so today, we want to continue in our Sunday school lesson. It is entitled, For His Purpose. And I'd like to read, if you would please stand in honor of God's word as we do our initial reading. We're going to look at Luke 1, 26, and we're going to follow until, I'll tell you when to stop, brother. 26, it says, and in the sixth month, the angel, Gabriel, was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art fa highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Verse 37, I'm going to read that again. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now I'd like to skip down to verse 46 if you're following in your Bible. It says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he, is, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy." as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. I'd like to stop there. Sister Creasy, would you pray? Father, we're so thankful for the word of God that we've heard in our, in our lesson Lord today. Thank you, God, because you've got everything in control. Lord, you know exactly, Lord, what this congregation needs to hear today. And we pray for the anointing to be upon Brother Mark. Yes. We pray that you would use him mightily yes. and that our hearts would re be receptive yes. to your word. God, we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. We praise you and we thank you for these blessings in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Thank you so very much for standing. The Bible tells us that humans were created to be in a relationship. And the relationship consists of being loved and giving love. Matthew 22, 37 through 40 reads this way. It says, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love God and love others. And if you can do that, then you can fulfill the will of God for your life. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, Matthew 18, 3 through 4, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so I'm building a foundation for you here today to say that God says if you can truly love, if you understand what that word means, if you understand sincere, godly Christian love, then you can overcome anything. Because the law, the prophets, all of the things rest upon the principle of love. If you love God 
And if you love others, you're going to make it. And so we continue that saying with Jesus and the little children. And he says, let them come to me. Because unless you, being adults, having our own agenda, our own ideas, our own passions, our own jobs, our own careers, whatever you're passionate about, unless you become as a little child, then you shall not see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus tells us. To. Now think about what that means. Your child, all of you have raised children at one point or another, most of you at least, and so you know that if that child is fed, you're going to feed that child. If that child has a roof over their head, it's going to be you that is responsible for making certain that that child has a roof over their head. Something to drink. The basic needs of every child is fulfilled in the parent, the mother and the father. And Jesus says, unless you get yourself in a position with God that you can depend on him totally for everything in your life, then you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. That sounds pretty difficult. That sounds pretty tough. But he's saying we must be totally devoted, totally committed to the Lord in heaven. And so that's what the teaching of the Bible is. Jesus in another place says you're either for him or you're against him. There's no middle ground. In the book of Revelation, he says... Because you are warm, you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of your mouth. He's saying, don't be average. Average is not a blessing. Average is a curse. Because you're sitting right there comfortable, and you think you have something, but you don't have anything. I'd rather you be on fire, or I'd rather you be lost. That's what he's saying in our language. As opposed to just sitting there and doing little to nothing, being an average Christian. In the book, The Gospel of Luke, Luke Timothy Johnson writes that Mary is among the most powerless people in her society. She is, a young, she is young in a world that values age, female in a world ruled by men, power in a stratified economy. Furthermore, she has neither husband nor child to validate her existence. I want to do a little study with you just a moment about the role of a woman 2,000 years ago. Women were treated just like children. They were treated like they had to have a man to take care of them. And so a woman lived in her father's home until her father gave her hand in marriage to a man. Then she became, I hate to use the word property, but she was responsible to that man. And if that man happened to die, then she became the responsibility of her oldest son. Now, if she didn't have any sons, then she would become the responsibility of either that man's brother, or if that man had no brother, then she would become the responsibility of her father or her father's uncle once again. The point is, she had to have a man to make her decisions for her. So think about how uh, this happens when Mary sees Gabriel for the first time. God sends a messenger to a woman whose word didn't even account for an eyewitness testimony. Her word wouldn't hold up in court because she was treated merely as a child. She couldn't stand on her own because she needed a man to validate her existence as we just read from this gentleman's book as we quoted that. And so he came, Gabriel, to a woman. And he told this unmarried woman that you're going to become pregnant with the child of the Most High God. Think of that. In a world where if she had cheated on her husband or she had been unfaithful, it was not uncommon for him to take her out back and stone her to death. She's the one that has to have the faith to say yes when she knows it could mean her very life. Think about that. She's answering to an angel, Gabriel, and he says that God wants to do something with you. You are highly favored. You are blessed. You're a virgin maiden. You're not married. You've been betrothed to Joseph, but that's just where they become engaged. It's kind of a time of engagement where she's been promised to him, but they haven't actually gone through with the marriage. And so she's betrothed to a man, and Gabriel comes and says, listen, if you'll trust God, he's going to put a child inside of you. And she asked what all of us would have asked. How will that be since I have not known a man? How can I have a child? She knows it takes a man and a woman to have a child. How is this going to happen? And he says, well, the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. And that holy thing that grows inside you is going to be Jesus. He will save his people from their sin. We read those stories, a lot of times we read it around Christmas time, and we think, oh, how blessed Mary was, and how holy that is, and we think good thoughts, and that's good. But I want you to imagine if you were Mary living in a world controlled by men, 
and you could be killed for what you were getting ready to go through. Her decision could mean life or death for her. She didn't know how Joseph would act. She didn't know how her father or her father's house would respond. She didn't know how her community would respond to her when she became pregnant and she tells them a story about how God has come upon her. How would you feel if one of your friends came and said, I'm pregnant, and an angel visited me and said that I'm going to give birth to the Messiah? That had never happened in human history and hasn't happened since. She was the one and only, the blessed, the highly favored, that was given the opportunity to give birth to the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. Think about the courage that it took for her to say yes, for her to say yes under those conditions. She didn't have all the details, but it didn't depend upon the reality of the culture in which she lived. What Mary shows us is that she believed there was a God, and she believed that God knew what was best for her, and she wanted to serve the Almighty God. Those three things. There is a God first. That God is going to bless me. I want to serve God. And if you will make those declarations in your own life, you may not know how it's going to happen. You may not know A, B, and C, and B. You may not understand the end from the beginning, but God does. And if you'll follow him, and if you'll walk in his name, if you'll honor him in your daily life, you will be blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Blessed and highly favored. She heard the word of an angel. And she said, if it's God's will, I'll do it. Now we think about that and we think, wow, she's real holy, but these are just regular, ordinary people that had gotten a hold of the fact that there was a God that loved them. And so if you will believe today, if you'll leave this place, maybe you won't remember the music. Maybe you won't remember who we greeted out in the parking lot or you won't remember the handshakes or the hugs. But if you'll just remember this phrase, there is a God and he loves you. If you will put that in your heart, you will begin a relationship that will last you for a lifetime. And through good times and bad, God will keep you. God will bless you. God will do miracles in your life. You will see the supernatural. You will experience the blessings of God. You'll see it in your family. You'll see it in your life. You'll see it on your job. Because you made a declaration on October 17th of 2021 in that church on Holly Grove that there is a God and he loves me. And if you can buy into that, you will do the impossible. Amen. I didn't say you might. I said you will do the impossible. Right. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. I don't care the nice vehicle you drove up in, the job you have in town. It does not matter. Mary didn't have any of those things. She was the lowest of the low in her society. No child, no husband, a bear, a virgin. She said yes. And so what will you say? God, if it is thy will, do it. And we see what happens. She didn't know how God would work. She didn't know how her bills would be paid. She didn't know the shame that would be brought to her father's home had Joseph rejected her. She didn't know maybe her own life would be cut short because of her willingness to obey God. Imagine this. You're told that if you obey God, you're going to die. And that's what Mary was faced with. That's the reason we call her blessed. That's the reason her name is mentioned in the scripture is because she was willing in a world that was not godly to be a godly person, a God-fearing woman, and to do the will of God. And now we call her blessed. Luke 1 and 38 repeating says, But when Mary heard all the angel had to say, she did two things. And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. She's saying, I belong to the Lord. Number one, behold the handmaiden of the Lord. I'm his. And then she said, be it unto me according to thy word. So she made two statements there. First she said, I belong to God, and so be it. Whatever God decides. And then Mary's song, we read that together. That's where we picked up the second half of the reading. That's where she sings a beautiful melody in honor of the Lord God, that he would choose her. See her faith. 
It wasn't fear. It wasn't trepidation. It was, oh my God, the blessing that I have to be the mother of the Messiah. She didn't know that that Messiah was going to go and be nailed to a tree, that that mother was going to watch her child take his last breath. She didn't know what that meant. All she knew was there was a God in heaven that loved her and she was willing to give up her life for him. That's all she knew. And she sings a beautiful medley called Mary's Song in your Bible. We read it together. Worshiping the Almighty God, believing in His promises, knowing that though we don't understand, God understands. And if we will just allow Him to work in our lives, He will do His work. She was stating she was a servant of God. She confirmed her purpose and that it's God's purpose, and she submitted to God's purpose in her life. And Mary did not try to take control of the situation. She confirmed her path forward in the word of God and expressed trust in the plan God had put forth. I have experienced in my own life, I have talked to so many saints and ministers and others that say, I know that God wants to do something in my life, but I don't know how it's going to happen. I heard a minister say that if God's put you there and you have no idea how it's going to happen, you can be rest assured that it is a God thing. You don't know how the bills are going to be paid. God knows. You don't know how you're going to reach the lost. God knows. You don't know how you're going to reach that community. God knows. You don't know how long you're going to have to serve before you're going to receive this or that. God knows. God knows. And so it's time that the church in Covington, if no one else, stand upon the promises of God and say that though God slay me, yet will I trust him. In a world riddled with evil and disease and illness and people that are doing great harm. It's time for the church to be willing to stand up and say, whatever God wants for me, I'm willing to do it. If we don't, who will? Mary did not have a clear understanding of what was about to happen. Luke 134 said that then Mary said to the angel, how will this be that I know not a man? Mary had an obvious biological question. We mentioned a moment ago, how can I have a baby and I know not a man? It's a God thing. It defies the laws of logic. It defies the laws of biology. You're going to have situations in your life that's going to defy the laws of finance. You don't know how you're going to pay it, but it's going to get paid. You don't know how you're going to do it, but God's going to do it. And so if you'll just stand up and say and declare that it is a God thing, I know what God is doing in my life, and I know that God will do what he said he would do. And you just stake your life on that and watch God work. God can do the impossible. He can do things that the world says is foolish, and he can show them to their shame that he can do the foolish. And he can work out those things that we try so desperately to work out for ourselves. We grow up in a culture that says, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Go out and do it. If you don't do it, nobody's going to do it. And those are not bad things. But the problem is, if we don't allow God to work, if we don't put him first in our lives, then all of our labor, all of our work, all of our dreams, all of our plans, all of our goals are in vain because they're built on no foundation. Either there is a God or there's not a God. And it's time that the church act like there is a God. Amen. And stop acting like that there is no God. God is good when there's food on the table. God is good when there's a car in the driveway. God is good when the job is right, when the spouse is right, when the kids are acting right. God is good when the church service is good, when everybody's running the aisles and the preacher's on point and the musicians sing my favorite song. God is good. But too often today we have so many that when the food is not on the table and the job is not so good and the spouse is not good and the, and the children are not good and everything is not good, it's easy to say, I can't do it. I quit. I give up. The Bible says endure. 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 Keep going. Keep walking. Keep stepping. Don't quit. Because if you won't quit... God won't quit. And that's what the Bible says. Just keep going and watch God work. Even when it doesn't feel good. Even when you'd rather stay home, come. Go one more time to that altar. Pray one more time. I know it's been a thousand times you've asked God to do this. You've asked God to do that. Keep praying. Keep 
nasty. Jesus tells a parable of an unjust judge, and he says this woman just worries him and worries him and worries him and worries him, and finally that judge says, go and take care of whatever that woman needs. She is worrying me to death. And so he's teaching us. You come back to that altar and you pray one more time. You seek God with tears, that brokenness, that contrite heart. And God's going to eventually, he's going to do what you need him to do. Because you're his child and he loves you. He loves you. Once you are born again, you become a child of God. And that means that God is interested in you. That means that you have made a decision. And that decision for the rest of your life has put you into the kingdom of God. And so if you will cry out to your heavenly father, he will not listen to you for long before he will finally respond. Amen. Right. When John Mark was very small, I used to take him to work with me. He'd be real small. And, and he called it Coca-Cola. I worked for Coca-Cola at the time. And I love this story because it reminds me of what we're talking about here this morning. But he would get it. He's about this tall, and he's got this big two-wheeler. He's pushing it, you know, and it's real low. And, and all the women in the Dollar General or wherever we were working, they just loved it. It was so cute just to watch him work, you know. And he'd say Coca-Cola, and, and they just loved it, you know. And so he was helping me, and I have a picture on my desk at home of him with a little two-liter Coke bottle that he was trying to put on a shelf that was much too heavy and much too high for him to reach. I remember one time God taught me something in one experience with him, and that was this. I had told my son not to get away from me. Stay with me. Stay with Daddy. Well, he saw a toy or something. You know how children are. And so he got off the path. He wasn't following me like I told him to follow me. His eyes weren't on me like Daddy had told him to do. He went off to the toy aisle. Now, I, I hid around an end cap so my eyes, I could see him, but I just wanted to teach him a little lesson, I thought. You know, I done told him not to go away from me, to stay close to me. I done told him about the dangers. You need to be here with Dad because Dad will protect you. Well, he went off to the toy aisle or whatever it was, and so I'm watching him. Remember, I'm going to teach him a lesson. And so he says, Daddy... And I notice he finally realizes he's not where he's supposed to be. He's not close to his father like he was supposed to be. He did not listen to the words of his father when his father told him to stay close. He says, Daddy. And he looks around and he walks a little bit down the aisle and he says, Daddy. And I'm watching, remember, I'm teaching him something. I'm teaching him a lesson. He's supposed to listen. And he didn't listen. He disobeyed his father. And so here we are. Finally, that third time, he goes, Daddy! And he starts crying. And my father, I ran and grabbed that boy. I picked him up. I loved on him. I hugged his neck. I told him everything was going to be okay. Yeah. That's how I feel God does us. Amen. And I feel like God taught me a lesson that day. He said, I said stay close to me, but you didn't stay close. I said obey my words, obey my voice, but you didn't obey my words and my voice. You went out into the world. Remember, he's on the toy aisle. He's seeing all that the world has to offer. You went out into the world, and so it's testing time. Right. You finally get down on your knees, and God, you don't hear it. Say your call and prayer at home, God. Nothing happened. But when you get down on your knees and you weep before God and you cry out, Daddy, that's when God shows up because the test has to be over because that's my child. He belongs to me. She belongs to me. And I cannot allow her to go through that when I have all power in heaven and earth. That's when God will show up is when you are sincere, when you are devoted to the idea that there is a God and that he loves me and that this trial may last, but it won't last forever because God is invested in me. I am his child and I belong to him. God loves you. God hears you when you pray. Sometimes he is silent. Sometimes he doesn't run and grasp you and pick you up. But he's going to one day. And if you can hang on to that fact that God will do right. God is right. God is just. In a world that is wrong, in a world that's unjust, God is right and God is just. And if you hold on to those ideas, then God will do great and mighty and marvelous things with you and in you and through you. God spoke to me that day and he said, just like you as a natural father, ran to your child when he was in desperation. That's how your heavenly father responds to you. I've never forgotten that. 
Mary was an ordinary girl, but she was committed to God. That's what's most important. It was not who her father was. It wasn't who her husband was. It wasn't because of her status in the community. She had none. She was totally committed to God. That's what made her special. It wasn't degrees. It wasn't education. It wasn't ministry. It was the fact that there was a girl, one girl at least, that was blessed and highly favored. Why? Because God made her that way because she was committed totally to God. That's all God's asking for. He's asking for a total commitment. He's asking for you to give him your heart. He has everything else. He has all the access to all the money in the world, the cattle on a thousand hills, all the land, all of humanity. He can do what he wills. He is sovereign. But the Bible says the one thing that he cannot have without you is your heart, your commitment, your life, your passion. And that's what he wants from you. He wants you to commit to him. And live every day of your life according to his word, obeying it, and having a daily time of communion with him. Mary's commitment to God and his word were stronger than her commitment to her own personal ambition and status in society. That means that she was willing to give up everything for what God had promised her. Think about this. She had a good future. She had a beautiful future. She was getting ready to be married to an honorable man. Well, how do you know he was an honorable man? Because keep reading. It says Gabriel goes and tells him. It says he was not an unjust man. He was a just man. He couldn't go through with the marriage, but he was going to put her away privately because he knew if he brought her before the elders of the city, it likely meant that she would die. He was going to put her away privately. He was going to do the right thing in a world that was unjust. He was a just man. And so the angel goes to him and says, listen, what she says is true. Now think about what that cost him. You think it's a fact that we don't read about his name very often after the birth story, the birth of Christ? I imagine he became the talk of the town. I imagine he was ridiculed for his decision. That man believes God is the father of that baby. God ain't put that baby in her. That man's a fool. He married a harlot. That's probably the kind of reputation he had around town. But you know what? He stood by her side. He had other children with her. He went through with the marriage, the Bible says. And so finally he put his reputation and all that it meant to the side. And he said that though it cost me something, yeah. I will obey God. Amen. When I read about King David, I love the story where it says he goes and buys the threshing floor of Aruna. He says, I want to purchase it. He says, oh no, King, you can have it. He says, no, I want to purchase it. I will not dedicate something to God that cost me nothing. That's what David said. Abraham, when he goes to buy a field to bury his beloved, he wants to buy the field. No, you can have it. You've been a blessing to us. I will not dedicate something to her memory that cost me nothing. And so if we are going to be honorable and noble people, get ready because Jesus said they hated me and they're going to hate you too. When I get down and when I get discouraged, I remember that they nailed him to a cross and he shed blood and he did those things so that I could be a part of the kingdom of God and they have not yet nailed me to a cross. They have not yet pointed a gun at my forehead. And so Jesus is not asking me to do anything that he himself was unwilling to do. He says, love those that are unlovable and do the work of God because the work of God is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. It's not the job, the banknotes, the houses, the cars, the automobiles, all those things that we dedicate our lives to. That stuff is going to burn up, the Bible says. What really matters is you and your relationship with God. And if you get that right, everything else will flow from that. Your children will get right. Your spouse will get right. Your job will get right. Your church will get right. The community will get right. If you will connect to God in a very real and intentional and sincere way, then you will see the hand of God on your life. That's what the Bible teaches. There is a hero in the Bible story. His name is Jesus. And the Bible says that God loved you so much that he didn't send a substitute. He himself came enveloped in flesh. He wore a robe of flesh. He came as a man, 100% human being. The Bible says that he looked for a man and he could find none. No one that could do what needed to be done. So God himself loved you. I said loved you so much that he came fashioned as a man and he he laid down his life freely and he died the death of a criminal. That's right. That's right. Embarrassed and humiliated 
before men so that you would know that one day you will have hope and that as he was resurrected, you will be resurrected. You can have a relationship with God and it's been purchased at the altar of Christ and his sacrifice. Mary willingly sacrificed her status in society to follow God's purpose. Mary stepped into an unpredictable future with unforeseeable calls, but she believed in the word of an unfailing God. She had nothing. She had no plans, no future. Gabriel just said, if you'll believe God's word, he's going to place a baby in you. And that baby is going to be the son of God, is going to be the one that will take away the sins of the world. That's all she had was the word of God delivered by an angel, a devout young lady. She didn't know how the bills would be paid. She didn't ask the angel, how will Joseph understand? She didn't ask a bunch of questions filled with doubt. Her faith said, God said. And so her faith said, let's do it. And so it's time that we as church members as ambassadors those that carry the name of Jesus Christ to go out in faith saying that though I don't know God knows and God will do what God said he would do and so it's time that the church of all people have faith in an everlasting all powerful almighty supernatural God that is totally invested and committed to our good and that's what it says I went to a little meeting, Brother Roger Scott and some of those have gone to called the Emmaus Walk. And there was this man that got up and he gave a speech. And he told us about all these injuries and these broken bones and all that. I guess he was kind of bragging how many times he'd been hurt. And then at the very end of it all, he said something that I've never forgotten. He said, if it takes my pain to bring God glory, then Lord, just let it rain. And so what he meant was God is sovereign. I don't know why all these things happen to me, but I know God knows, and I love him. And if I believe that God loves me, and I do, then God, whatever it takes to bring you glory, I'm willing to be an instrument in your hands. I didn't say in my hands, I'm not trying to build a career. I'm not trying to build a big name. I'm not trying to build multi-million dollar followings. I am trying to say that there is a God in heaven that loves me and that I am a part of his plan. And if that means pain, bring it. If that means good things, bring it. And ultimately remember that it is time to live for God. It's easy to preach about healing when you're not sick. It's easy to preach about finances when the bills are paid. But when those things change, where do you stand? And that's what the Bible says. What good would it be for you to have all your natural needs met and die and go to hell? What good is it for you to be rich in this life? And enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, only to die. And when you taste your last breath, or you take your last breath, you die lost. The Bible says heaven is a real place. And the Bible says hell is a real place. And if you need to know about that, talk to me. I'll tell you all about it. We don't have time today. But I want to tell you, hell is real. Amen. Satan is real. You have an enemy, an adversary. And heaven is yours to gain if you will make that decision today to live with Jesus. Because Jesus will not fail you in a world that will fail you. You can stake it all on him. And that's what the Bible teaches. Take it from testimony after testimony. Men and women that you have heard that have said, I depend on Jesus. Now, it didn't look the same for them as it will look for you. That question is not answered the same way by you. But all I know is when I cried, he heard me when I cried. When I lifted my hands in pain, he healed my broken body. When I did the will of God, I felt like my life had purpose and my life had meaning. Even when I had nothing to show for it, I knew to God and I knew that it was time to do what God was calling me to do even if it cost me everything because my heroes that are in the Bible said why would I give God an offering that cost me nothing Mary was willing to give it all up Abraham was willing to give it all up the heroes of the faith that we read about in Hebrews 11 they are in there because they risked everything for the almighty name of the almighty God it's time for people to pray earnestly and sincerely to have a daily time of relationship with God you say you love him do you think about your own relationships for just a moment the only reason why Mary was so devout was because she had a relationship with the Almighty before this. This don't just happen. 
This means that she had heard about Yahweh taught to her from her youth being a devout Jewish girl. Knowing that one day Yahweh himself would come as a Messiah, a deliverer. She had heard that. That had been read in her hearing. She had been brought up and raised to believe there is a God. And one day that God is going to save all of mankind. She had that foundation. She had that knowledge. She had been raised and built of the right stuff. And she just expressed her faith. When it came decision time, she made the right decision. Well, Brother Mark, she was blessed. She was given the opportunity to raise the Messiah. He grew up in her home, yes. But she also watched him die as a criminal on a cross. And though he healed thousands, though he had a fan club that went on for days, he had to feed 5,000 plus women and children. He had to feed 4,000 plus women and children. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he was popular that day. Jairus' daughter was raised back to life. A centurion came and said, your word only, and I know it will be done. And he gave his word. A leper came and said, if you're willing, I know. And he said, I'm willing, and he healed. He opened blinded eyes. He did great works and great miracles. But on that day, standing at the bottom of that cross, they looked up on a criminal and it was Mary and John. His mother followed him to the day of his death. And she believed in him because she was in that upper room on Acts 2 when they got filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. And she was filled with the Holy Ghost as the other 120. Yes, Mary's blessed. Yes, she's highly favored. But imagine watching your son raised in your home die that death and then call her blessed. The word of God is going to cost you everything. But what you will find out is that you will be blessed because you divide or you divide, you're devoted to the word of God. If you seek first healing, if you seek first miracles, if you seek first emotion, if you seek first the spiritual, if you seek first only these exciting things, you're not building on the right foundation. If you make a declaration today that there is a God, he has his word, and I'm going to devote myself to him. If you build everything on that foundation, you're going to get all that other stuff wrong. Right. It's a matter of priorities. You build on the fact that there is a God that loves me even when I don't feel like I'm lovable. There is a God that gave himself for me even in a world that says no one loves me, God loves me. Even in a world that says I'm not good enough, God says I'm good enough. If we will buy into the idea of the Bible, the Bible says God created you in his image. You are special to him. That he gave himself for you. He came down and he put on flesh and shed blood so that you might be reconciled with a holy God. And that when you cross over that Jordan... When you have to die, it won't be strange for you because Jesus will meet you on the other side. The Bible says, why are we afraid of death when Jesus conquered death? Why are we afraid of anything that life has to bring against us when Jesus Christ did all those things? God, he fed the 5,000. Why do we worry about where our next meal comes from? He opened blinded eyes. Why do we put all of our faith in medicine and doctors and the world's program when Jesus himself, just a little touch of the master's hand in a world that did not know hospitals, in a world that did not know medication, he could because he was all they had. It's easy for us to say, well, we're going to believe God for healing when we've got an appointment tomorrow with the best cardiologist in town. They didn't have that. And if you want to see where the miracles are happening in the Christian church today, go to Africa, those third world countries where all they've got is the word of a man. And that man says there's a God that loves them and that God will heal them. And you watch these little babies that are malnourished, their little bellies swollen out because they can't eat. Moms and dads that have no hope in anything. They've given up everything. No man has ever done what they hope that Jesus Christ can do. And you come up to that altar with that attitude, God, if you don't do it. How would you pray if you felt like God wouldn't hear you unless you were desperate? How would you pray if you felt like God was delaying on you? Every day, we have to have an intentional relationship with God. Period. 
Now, we live in a world where that's not as popular, where they like to say, come and give an offering one service a week, and God will make you a millionaire. And God's going to heal your body every time. And God's going to do it. They, they say that stuff all the time. I get on social media, and, and I see churches. Oh, we had 300 filled with the Holy Ghost. We had 500 get baptized in Jesus' name. And I'm thinking, my goodness, when's the last time that's happened around our place? But, you know, the real question is not those things because that's immature Christianity. What do I mean by that? I mean that the Bible says when you come as a small child, you get filled with the Holy Ghost because you've come to that place in your life where you say, if it is what it is, it's got to be because I believe only in God. God fills you with the Holy Ghost. You have an emotional and a supernatural experience. But Paul later says in Galatians 5, and I say this often, especially in our world today, that a mature Christian will show the fruits of the Spirit. So it goes beyond the evangelistic appeal, and it goes to a life of obedience and dedication to the almighty Word of God. That is a signature of a mature Christian. Somebody that when it doesn't feel good, they're here. Somebody that when it doesn't look good, they're here. Somebody that does what God has called them to do, even if it costs them everything. That's maturity. Paul says when that person comes to know the Lord, they're, burn, they're born again by the Holy Ghost. That's the excitement. That's the emotion. That's the evangelism. Praise God. It's the plan of God. But he says you're a babe in Christ. And that means that it's up for the church to make disciples, to go alongside them, to teach them how to walk and how to talk. Think about how you reared your children. We were so excited when they first said daddy or mommy. We were so excited when they first walked for themselves. He's saying that's how a new Christian is. That's how a new believer is. When they're born again of the Holy Spirit, then it's time for the church to make disciples because that's when it's time to learn. How do I pray? The Man, Philip went to the eunuch, and the eunuch said, How shall I understand unless someone teach me? It's up to the church to build disciples, to show them the way to study the Bible, the way to pray, the way to build spiritual disciplines. The disciples went out. Jesus in Mark 6 had already told them, Go out. You can cast out demons and devils, and he commissioned them to go out and do the same thing that they had seen him do. They had watched the master do great and wonderful things. In Mark 9, they come back and they were defeated. How come we can't do what you said we could do? And Jesus said, these things only come through fasting and prayer. Sincere devotion to God. You want to know what desperation is? Then start taking away from the flesh and notice how the spirit is uplifted and encourage when you take away from the flesh. That's what fasting does. It's where you deny your body what it wants because you believe that you will be blessed spiritually by denying your flesh. And so the principle is this. Paul tells you there's a war going on in every human being. There's a war of the spirit versus the flesh. In your nature, you are carnal. You want the wrong things. You'll make the wrong decisions. And so if you are led by God's spirit, then you are spirit led. And so if you want to grow spiritually, you have to deny your flesh. And food or fasting is one of the ways that you deny your flesh. It's to say I'm hungry, but I'm going to take this time and I'm going to get in God's word. I'm going to get in time of prayer. And I'm going to believe that it will build my relationship with God. Well, that don't make sense, Brother Mark. It's in the Bible. Just trust it. Just try it. And you come back two or three weeks from now, we'll give you the microphone. And you tell us about how God filled you with the Holy Ghost in your living room because you fasted for two days and you said, God, if it's real, I want it. You come. We'll let you tell, tell us about it. It's in the Bible. Trust it. And try it. And see what happens. It's time that the church of all people stand up for Jesus Christ because they're running him down. Our Savior is being destroyed in our very midst. We're seeing it everywhere we look. We're seeing churches filled with false doctrine. That they sing songs and all you hear is Jesus and it sounds like a rap or a, rap or a rock concert. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of insincere churches. And I'll tell you, I understand Jesus these days when he goes out and he's angry with the religious people because they should have known better. And they did they criticized him for going to the sinful, for being the great physician, going and me having meals with prostitutes and tax collectors. He says, these are the people that don't know any different. I'm here to save them. Right. But he was always angry at the religious people right. because they knew better, and they didn't do it. And so as he told us in Revelation, it's time that we no longer be lukewarm. We be on fire for God. 
If you want to know how that looks, that means that you get up just a little bit earlier and you do a little Bible reading. I know that's hard. And I know that snooze button is so easy. You can hit it so many times. And I know that job is not understanding. They don't want to hear that you came in 30 minutes late because you had to have your Bible time. They don't care about that. So it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. But you get on up first thing. I believe first thing in the morning. Now, some people say late at night. Jesus prayed all night. He prayed early. Mark 135 says, it says pray three times a day in Daniel. You read that in Psalms. Listen, I'm not telling you there's a plan or a program. I'm just saying pray. Pray. And I will tell you that what I found is if I begin my day in prayer and Bible study, my whole day goes better because I'm reminded of my purpose. I'm reminded that there's a God that loves me. I'm reminded that if I'll keep walking for him, he's going to eventually make all these things come to pass. He's going to do what he said he would do. The ministry that he's given me is going to touch lives. It's going to bless homes. It's going to make great miracles happen in this day. And you have a ministry too. The great commission is that you go out and you teach the world about Jesus. Use your words if allowed, but also your lifestyle, your actions, your attitude. They want to see you. When they're crying, have that joy that's unspeakable, full of glory. They want you to see, they want to see that joy that the world did not give and that the world cannot take away. And so what we've studied today is Mary, her devotion, the consequences of her actions. She didn't know what would happen. All she knew was there was a God, that he loved her, and that she was his child. So I want to read in Jeremiah 1, 4 through 7. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And we see that in the very beginning, but if you know anything about Jeremiah and about his ministry, you'll know that it wasn't good. He was put in a pit because of what he preached. He was the one that gave all the bad news. He was the one that said, Repent, or God's going to put his wrath upon the nation of Judah and they locked him up for it. It cost him everything. But it says he came to a point in his ministry where he said he would no longer do what God called him to do. And then Jeremiah 28 through 9 says, For since I spake, I cried out. I cried out, he says. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision. Every time I opened my mouth to speak, people hated what I had to hear. Then I said I would not make mention of him nor speak any more of his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He said I decided to quit. I decided to give up. It was not worth it. But he said like that fire shut up inside of me, I could not quit. I had to keep saying what God called me to say. And so the challenge I leave you with this morning, if you would please stand, please stand. The challenge I leave you with this morning is this. Listen to the voice of God. Fulfill the ministry that he has for your life. Say yes, even though you don't know how you're going to pay for it. Say yes, even though you don't know when your family's coming. They're coming. Just pray for it. Say yes. Pastor says when you don't know what to do, just do what you know is right. And that often doesn't feel good. Everybody wants to shout. Everybody wants to run the aisles. We're living in a day when weeping is the language of the true church. Because we look all around us and we see that people are dying and they're going to hell. We went to a pumpkin patch yesterday. There was a thousand people there. And as I looked through the crowd, I saw people that didn't look like me, people that didn't talk like me, people that didn't do the things I did. But Jesus laid it on my heart. He said, they look like sheep with no shepherd. And if it is in your heart to change the world, you're not going to do it in your own name. It's not because of your money or your job. You don't have enough of it, I promise you. But if you'll give them Jesus and the message he proclaimed, you will give them hope, and you will see them in heaven with you one day. 
I'd like to pray for you.